Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel. I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. So continuing with Messiah Shacharim, we missed a week uh, last week because it was Tisha B'Av. Um, uh, unfortunately, sad to say, Mashiach is not here yet. Bezer Hashem, Mehebri Amenu soon. So continuing on, this is part 22. Seal Shasharim again, it's the way of the upright path of the just. It depends how some people explain it differently. This is from Art Scroll, and it's by uh, the Ramchal or Moshe Chaim Sato. So, trying to recap here, if I remember where we were at, we were in chapter 4, um, and this was um, still on Zihirus, which is vigilance, and this one is about the way to acquire it. And there uh, were different levels of contemplation. And before he, uh, I'm not going to go through because I don't remember exactly what it was, so if you want to listen to the previous video again, um, he was talking about the highest level of contemplation. Uh, maybe I'll look through this really quickly so I could see. Um, fear of sin is something he mentioned. And, um, oh, and I will have a link to our school below as well. I forgot to mention uh, this safer. Anyway, I'll let you <laughs> go back on that. So now I'm up to the second level of contemplation. Now this um, might be a little bit longer than uh, previous videos and also since we didn't have last week um, because I want to get through this second level um, and it's a little few extra pages. So we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to go through it as quickly but as efficiently as possible so you don't miss anything. So the second level, so here it says, but for those on a lesser level than the first group, so the first group, that means was on a higher level, um, their inspiration must be achieved according to their level of discernment, um, meaning that it must be based upon the concept of the honor that they crave. So what is this saying here, commentary? The second group, to whom Ramchal refers, is the class of people who are motivated by honor and recognition. To be sure, Ramchal addresses people who are well aware of the truth that the righteous will have places of honor in the world to come. However, they are not pure-minded like the members of the first group. So the first group realizes that. So, thus, the possibility that they will fall short in fulfilling their potential in divine service does not terrify them and will not inspire them sufficiently to propel them to the hero. So, that's, for them, that's not an issue. So, they can, however, be inspired by focusing on the honor that the righteous will have in the world to come. And then it says, see the insight below on page 77, but we're not there yet, so we're not going to get to that. Um, when we get there, we'll get there. Okay, so then continuing on, he says here, this motivation is as follows. It is obvious to any sensible person that the level of, of accomplishment and reward are not distinguished from each other in the world of truth, which is the world to come, which they call Olam HaEmet or Olam HaMiti. Um, except in accordance with one deeds in this world, meaning there's no difference in the reward, but... In the, but, but it will depend on what you do here. And that only one who has more good deeds to his credit than does his fellow will be higher in status there. And conversely, who has fewer good deeds to his credit will be, will be a lowly one, meaning the more, the more good deeds you do, the higher you'll be. So if so, then how can a person avert his eyes from careful scrutiny of his deeds or reduce his effort in this regard? If afterwards, when he leaves this world and the time for divine reckoning arrives, he will certainly be distressed as a result of this in inattention at a time when he's no longer able to repair what he has corrupted. So that's the problem. The problem is, is that you think, how, how can you not pay attention to this, right? Because when, when it's time for your, for your you know, judgment day, then you're going to be upset that you never did anything. But the problem is that so many people, and I see it in my life, you know, Hashem Rachem, you should have mercy on people that they don't understand that what they're doing here is affecting what's going to be there and when they get there they won't be able to change anymore and then they'll know what's the absolute truth and they won't be able to do anything so that's the sad part so we have to just pray for them and hope that they will change um so continuing on so Ramchal notes a possible rationalization that may be offered by some members of this group so how would they rationalize it right now there are some foolish people unfortunately foolish people there are um, who want only to lighten the burden of divine service from upon themselves. So they want to think that, oh yeah, I don't, you know, they don't want to do as much. So who will say, so this is what they'll say, why should we weary ourselves with so much piety and abstinence? Is it not sufficient for us that we will not be numbered among the wicked who are judged in Gehenna? We will not push ourselves to enter the innermost sections of Gan Eden. So here they're taking like the, the they think it's, they're taking the, the, the what is it, the, the shortcut or the, you know, the, the, the quickest route, meaning, okay, so we're not going to go to Gehenna, 
but we're not going to kill ourselves to get to the best level in Gan Eden, meaning, you know, it's, it's okay, we'll just take whatever we get, right? So that's not a good attitude. So then he can, that's me saying that. And then he goes on, if we will not have a large portion there, we will at least have a small portion. So they figure, you know, for this, for us, this is sufficient. We will not make the yoke of our burden heavier in this world because of this pursuit of the highest level of reward in the world to come. So there is commentary, but I'm just going to say that so what they're saying is like, okay, we'll just get a little bit. We'll get just our small little portion, and we're not going to just, you know, make such a big deal here and work hard to get to that high level. So the commentary here says, this is an all-too-common rationalization. Uh, quote, I do not need to be such a big tzaddik. The main thing is that I am not a rasha, an evildoer. I will be satisfied with whatever portion Hashem grants me in the world to come. Ay, vay, vay, as we say. Uh, are those people not going to be happy? Like I once heard someone say to me, like, I'll deal with it when I get there. <laughs> I nearly like choked on that and I didn't say anything to her and the thing is, is that no you won't deal with it when you get there if you don't deal with it here there it's you're finished basically you're you're gonna have to uh, it's not gonna be such a good situation anyway continuing on so the fallacy of this argument that's what he brings us up now but let us ask them one question about this defense of their behavior would they be able to be to so easily bear even in this transient world seeing one of their colleagues be more respected and esteemed than they and dominate them? And all the more so if the person who attains the superior status is one of their servants or one of the poor people who are disdained and lowly in their eyes. Would they be able to tolerate having these, quote, inferior people command greater respect and admiration than they without being pained and without their blood boiling inside them? Certainly not. So here he's giving a good um, example of how, why this is, this is not a good argument. Is because imagine you have like somebody who works for you and they become better or higher superior than you. How would that make you feel? So that's the whole idea, meaning, you know, like he was below me and now look where he is, right? Okay, so continuing on, we know this to be true for indeed we can see with our own eyes that all the toll that a person expends in this world is to achieve superiority over whomever he can and to establish his place among the highest echelons of society. Um... And then it says in Kohelis 4.4, for this is man's rivalry with his fellow. And if one sees his fellow elevated while he remains lowly, it is certain that whatever he bears is only what he is forced to bear because he is unable to prevent it from occurring. But his heart smolders inside him with jealousy and bitterness, meaning if he can't, he, he, he can't prevent it from happening, but it still burns him. He's like burning inside from it. So the commentary here says, while a person will accept the reality that occasionally his fellow, even one whom he regards as inferior, will surpass him in status, certainly he will not do so calmly, as he is convinced that it is actually he who is superior and should be recognized in such meaning. He thinks he deserves it, meaning that's like, for example, I've heard people say, like, let's say, for example, you're in a job, there's two people, and then you find out your colleague, who's on, a, who, who isn't as, you know, seems as intelligent as you or as able as you, gets a position that you thought you were supposed to, you should be getting and getting more money. And you said, or he's younger than you, or all these things that people say, and you're like, how could that be, right? Okay, so continuing on here, he says, this truth puts the lie, I like that how he says it, this truth puts the lie to the rationalization of Vance above. Now, if it is so hard for them to be more lowly than others with regard to their place, in this illusory and false levels of this world, meaning this fake world, right? Then uh, where any lowliness is only superficial and any, quote, status is nothing but vanity and falsehood, how will they be able to bear seeing themselves in the world of truth, classified as more lowly than those very men who are now in this world considered more lowly than they? So if that seems a little confusing, so what he's saying is that... Um, so imagine those people who are in this world, they seem to be high, but it's a false world. Um, and then you are classified as more lowly than those men who are considered lowly here. So that's even worse for you. And furthermore, this establishment of the, uh, their inferiority, inferiority will occur in the place of true eminence and eternal honor. So that's where it's going to happen. That And then the commentary here says, a little long commentary says, in this world, a resentful person can rationalize that he is truly the superior one, and eventually this will be acknowledged, if not here, then in the world to come. In the next world, however, prestige and exalted status are undeniably true and eternal. So there, whatever status you have, it's real, it is real. Here, it's, it's not necessarily so. Thus, if one is deemed inferior to his fellow in that world, he must suffer with the knowledge that this judgment is correct and everlasting, meaning up there. 
you know, like here you could you could you think you can get away with it, and up and down there, and uh, it's not uh, you know it's it's not what you think, right? So, like for example, you know, you think you're you're you have prestige here and money and wealth and power and blah 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 fame and all these things. And then when you go up there, you have nothing because you didn't really do anything. It was all superficial. Okay, so continuing on, actually the next commentary has a little longer commentary. The next thing, um, <clears throat> so continuing on here, um, so it's saying about the eminence and eternal honor, which although they did not yet appreciate it, they do not yet appreciate it and its value, and they therefore are not concerned about it, but in its time when they come to receive their eternal reward, they will certainly recognize its true worth very clearly to their pain and embarrassment. This inferiority will certainly be for them nothing other than a profound and everlasting source of pain. So there you go. You know, they, they are, you know, uh, their, their inferiority, that's, and they, they're bringing them down now because when they receive their reward, it's going to be, you know, um, uh, they'll see their, they'll be embarrassed because of what they could have done here that they didn't do. So the commentary here says, many people consider this world to be, quote, real, and the spiritual realm of the world to come is only an abstract ideal. However, the opposite is the truth. That's why this world is called Alma de Shikra. It's an uh, Aramaic term. It means world of lies, <laughs> and it is. However, the opposite is the truth. Man's ultimate purpose is realizing the world to come. While this world is nothing more than a vestibule, we say that a prose door, like it says in chapter 1. Thus, if lesser status pains a person in this world, how much more so will it distress me in the next? So if you're lowly here and up there, wow, it's like even worse. So there's an additional um, commentary here that says, In essence, the Ramchal is saying that just as one is jealous, when he sees his fellow receive more honor, oh, we're, we're, we're getting close to this, I just wanted to stop for a second, and I'll, I'll start that over, that I'm reaching... Um, or almost to the third level, so that's good. We have another couple pages. But hopefully I'm not going too fast and you're getting everything. I'll try to slow down. Um, in essence, the Ramchal is stating that just as one is jealous when he sees his fellow receive more honor in this world, so will he be pained by this occurrence in the world to come. And that pain will be ever so much greater than it, than it is in this world. One might wonder, what place is there for a negative trait like jealousy in the world of truth? So Rav Elia Lopian Sites in Matanas Chalko explains that the distress is actually part of the punishment that a person receives for having been jealous of his fellow in Israel. So, you know, Mida Kenegad Mida, I'm adding that. And that's what it says here afterwards, actually. Since he was unable to bear another's good fortune in this world, um, he is punished measure for measure by suffering the same, very same jealousy in the world to come. And then it says, see also Rabbi Ruham Lubavitz and Das Chachma Musar. So, this will occur only to those on the level that the Ramchal is now discussing who are actually envious of their fellows' achievements in this world. The truly righteous who do not suffer uh, from this, this failing when they see another's honor in the world to come, uh, when they see another's honor in the world to come, will be, quote, jealous only in the sense that they will feel badly for having failed to reach a level they could have attained. So that's what they're going to be jealous about, that they couldn't get that higher level. As the Ramchal explained above, uh, okay, so continuing on, so the Ramchal concludes. So you see... That this tolerance and willingness to receive only a small share of heavenly reward that they are advocating for themselves in order to ease from themselves the weight of divine service is nothing other than a false delusion with which their evil inclination is enticing them and not a valid argument at all. So that's what it is, okay? So there would never be a basis for them to fall for this spurious enticement if they would only see the truth of the matter. And commentary here says the fallacy of the argument presented above should be readily apparent to any sensible person. I, I, I emphasize sensible. It doesn't emphasize here, but I do. However, as Ramchal explained in the previous chapter, the evil inclination can blind a person's perception to the point that even the most implausible argument can seem to him absolutely correct, as we that was discussed before. Okay, continuing on here. So, but because they do not see the, seek the truth and instead continue blundering as they please, their delusion will not be removed from them. And the commentary here says, Hashem assists one who wishes to purify himself. It's, it goes, But he will allow, but he also allows a person to make incorrect choices. And he says, See Yoma 38p, meaning that's all he helps you with that. Thus, should a person fail to assess his deeds, Hashem will not save him from this mistaken course. And that's also, uh, and it talks about in the end of chapter 2 that we've done before. Rather, he will allow him to continue on his errant way until he, unless he motivates himself to change. Meaning, you know, he helps you too. If you say, oh, Hashem, please help me. I could Hashem, rob a bank. He'll help you. you know, like, whatever you ask him to help you with, that's what he's going to help you. And you hope it's actually something good. Okay, so continuing on. Until the time 
Um, so then this delusion will not be removed from them until the time when it will no longer help them to realize the truth. At that time when they stand for the divine judgment, it will be too late. That's why I, I said that before. So meaning that by that time, it, you know, you're out of luck, unfortunately. And I don't like these work. You're out of time. For they will no longer have the ability to repair what they have destroyed. So there you go. So if you don't do it here, that's it. You don't get another chance. And an elaboration of this point. This is what Shlomo HaMelech, peace be upon him, was referring to when he said in Kohelis 9.10, Whatever you are able to do with your ability, do. For there is neither action nor reckoning nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave where you are going. This means that whatever good deeds a person does not do, while the ability to do them is given to him by his creator, and this, quote, ability is the power of free will um, that is given to him all the days of his life during which he has free will and is commanded to act in the service of Hashem, he will no longer be able to do, do in the grave and the abyss. Meaning, if you don't do it here, Hashem gave you the Bechira, the choice to do uh, what you're supposed to do, and you didn't do it, when you leave, you're not going to be able to do it anymore. You're going to be out, out of time, like I said. And then he, he, when he no longer possesses this ability. Commentary here says, the only power that a person truly has is the ability to choose between good and evil. They say that everything else, meaning you can pick between the good and the evil, everything else is done, done for you before you uh, come into this world. The power to carry out his choices is not his own. Rather, it is always in the hands of Hashem, who assists those who wish to purify themselves, like I said before, and enables them to actualize their good choices. A person is granted a lifetime to properly exercise his free will by choosing to perform mitzvot. After death, one remains with the results of the choices he made during his lifetime. That's it. You know, unless you're blessed to have a, a clinical death and come back like Rabbi Alon, Anava, and some other people, you know, most people don't get that second chance. Okay, continuing on. For one who did not accumulate many good deeds during his lifetime cannot do them afterwards. One who did not make a reckoning of his actions in this world will not have the opportunity to make a reckoning then. And one who did not become wise in this world will not become wise in the grave. That's it, you know. And this is what Shlomo stated in that verse. For there is neither action, nor reckoning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you are going. And the commentary here says that Shlomo Amela mentions three distinct subjects in this verse, in the verse. Performance of good deeds, an accounting of one's actions, which is the essence of the hearers, and acquiring knowledge and wisdom. All these must be the goals of the living. They cannot be accomplished by the dead. So again, the three things he mentioned was performance of good deeds, an accounting of your actions, and acquiring knowledge and wisdom. Those are very important. So by exhort, I'm, I'm saying that I think they are. Uh, otherwise, he would mention it. And Shalom Elf was the wisest person. So um, by exhorting a person to do whatever he's able to, quote, with your ability, Shlomo emphasizes that one must choose with his God-given power of free will to do good, to make an accounting of his actions, and to acquire knowledge and wisdom. If one does not take this step on his own, no one will do it for him. Meaning, no, no one's going to like can say, "Oh, you learn for me," or "You do this for me," "You eat for me." You can't. Yeah, you have to do it yourself. Rather, he will be left to blunder until it is too late. After his death, he will recognize the truth, but will no longer be able to choose the way of truth. And I could say just a short a note on this if you want to look up Rabbi Anava's uh, clinical death experience. He he mentioned this in the video that. Um, uh, as, right before his neshama left his body, it, it, like it's like the veil was lifted. Uh, I'm not going to tell you his whole story. Go look it up. Uh, but he, he was not um, living the, the tr toward true life before he uh, had his uh, near-death experience. But when the veil lifted, before he, right before his neshama, he knew the, all the truth, and he was like, and I'm not going to say anymore. I'll leave, I'll leave the suspense for you to check out. His story is amazing. Okay, um, so continuing on here, so we're almost finished with this second level. So by contemplating this reality and recognizing that one's status um, in the world to come will relate directly to the efforts he made in this world to choose the correct path, one can be motivated to make the accounting required for Zahiras. This is the motivation for the second group of people, meaning those who are roused by the desire for honor. And then the final... Um, uh, uh, comment here, it should be noted that one who serves Hashem out of desire for honor is actually performing his service shalom lishma. What does that mean? Not for its own sake. The same applies to one who serves Hashem out of the desire for reward or fear of punishment, which Ramchal will surely suggest as a motivation for the general populace, just people in general. That's the next uh, third level. The true goal, however, is to serve Hashem lishma, which means for its own sake. That is, for the altruistic reason described above in the context of the first group. I also see Rambam Hilchos Chuvah 10, 1 through 5. 
Nevertheless, Ramchal advises that if one cannot be inspired to the heroes by the altruistic thoughts presented above, he should contemplate the honor of the world to come. And if that does not suffice, he should contemplate the matter of war and punishment. This is consistent with the teaching of the sages in Pesachim 50b. A person should always engage in the study of Torah and the performance of mitzvot, even not for its own sake, because by doing so, he will come to study Torah and perform mitzvot for their own sake. Meaning, shalolishma balishma is the expression. Meaning, first you do it this way, just like they say, you know, like, fake it till you make it. Meaning, keep doing it, and eventually you'll be doing it because you want to do it. Um, and then it says, this concept is also discussed at length, length below in chapter 16. And then, as Rav Hashem will get there, we'll discuss it. And then Rav Aaron Cutler, in Mishnah's Rav Aaron says, volume 1, page 108, he explains that it is often necessary to rely on motivational factors, such as fear of punishment to counter the effects of one's physical desires, which, um, while battle, which battle his enthusiasm for divine service. One, once, once earthly desire is subdued by the fear of punishment, a person's genuine inner eagerness to serve Hashem comes forth. Moreover, even when one performs a mitzvah or avoids a sin out of fear of punishment, he is in the final analysis consciously obeying the word of Hashem. So meaning if he's doing, even if he's doing it for that way, he's still obeying what Hashem wants him to do. This mindful adherence to his will is itself a great virtue, aside from the fact that it will eventually inspire him to obey Hashem for its own sake. Meaning, even if you did it that way and it was just like, you know, because you knew you had to, you're still following the word, what Hashem wants you to do, but... You're not doing it for its own sake, so eventually it'll get to that. So that's the end of the second level, and I know it went a little long, so I appreciate, uh, and I hope you um, got a, something out of this because it's important to know that. So the important part is that we need to do here and not not wait and not think that it's okay, whatever we're doing, and we can wait till we get there because that's not going to happen. And unfortunately, there are too many people like that, and they don't realize it, and it's sometimes hard to share with them that and they don't want to hear it so we do our best we try to pray for them and hope that Hashem will help them as well and I hope that we will all merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting Beit HaMikdash Amen and thanks for watching